unified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert... Danielle is on. She is organized-ish. Yeah, ish. she's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Danielle, um, we've got folks on here who are from all. <laughs> sorry, I just looked over, and uh, uh, my good friend Christopher Nauman from uh, Green Bay um, responded to my, um, you know, comments with a yeah, hey there. Or, okay. No, yeah, yader he, yeah, yader he, which okay. is like opposite of the way that I remember it being. But now he's giving me a smiley face. Um, so, so thanks to everybody. So, Danielle, what I'd like to ask you to do is to start out by telling the folks. So, so some of these folks know you very, very well because you know, in in Ohio and the other territories that you've worked with in years, you're you're frankly pretty beloved, and Thanks. we'll talk about why that is, uh, at least why I think that is, um, as we go forward. But um, we've also got folks from from other parts of the country. I've seen Wisconsin. I've seen um, nice. Maine. I believe I saw someone from Connecticut. Nice. Um, so so we've got folks from all over. Why don't you? Um, Start by telling a little bit about your background, the kind of work you've done in the past, and the kind of things that you're focused on right now. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna like my head's gonna wander off to the side a little bit because I want to pull up the um, the the guide that we talked about working through today. Oh, sure, sure. Um, well, I have worked with downtowns for about. 20 years at this point. I was first introduced to them in about 1997. So um, it's been a minute. It doesn't feel like it, but it's been a good minute. Um, and, you know, that's, I got bit. I, I love downtowns. I guess there's three things that you should know about me that will explain most of my baggage. I love downtowns. I like the small ones. I like the intersections. I like the linear ones. I like the great big ones. They're all endlessly fascinating to me. Um, and they're like any, uh, they're unlike any other economic entity out there. Um, and part of the reason I like them is because number two, I am a preservationist. So uh, I love old things. Um, I love uh, authentic places. I, I love the unique identity that every place has. It's very different from everyone else. So, and the third thing is, I know amazing people. I, I have been blessed in my life to have collected an amazing resource list. And I know some wonderful, wonderful folks. And uh, everything that I know has been gifted to me by them, pretty much. I, I listen and I try to integrate things. And, you know, I'm, I'm just blessed to know some really cool people. So I have some stories that uh, hopefully will illuminate some points and 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 give people some additional resources that they can, can contact after this, too. So that's me. Right. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, and, and so you talked about your work with downtowns and and I think everybody who's worked with you knows that that's really where your heart lies. Um, and is, is really in this question of enabling communities to um, to be revitalized and live into their potential, if I can put words in your mouth. Yep. But one of the um, one of the things that you've developed a particular talent for in the last few years is figuring out how to use existing funding strategies, um, grant programs, um, fed, um, you know, pass throughs, and the like, sure. to fund community revitalization initiatives. And you've done a lot of that work in Ohio, um, but you've also done that with other states as well. So why don't you uh, talk a little bit about, about that piece of the picture? Sure. Um, like you said, I'm, I'm primarily in Ohio, but uh, I do have a itty bitty slice in Pennsylvania and a little bit bigger slice in Kentucky. Um, and what that's done, well, I guess a, a little bit, little slice in Michigan too. Um, what that's done is give me an appreciation for things that are common uh, through the states. Um, they may not all label them the same, but they all have similar kinds of programs. 
Um, but you know what they do with them then is up to each state and each has its own little uh, caveats and personalities and um, personality quirks a lot of times. Um, but yeah, there's I mean, nothing quirky in this space. What's no, no <laughs> there's nothing quirky in this, you know, in this in this world. No, 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 no. Especially not between you and I. I mean, really. <laughs> We'll talk about that in a minute. All right, right. That's a whole nother session. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so really what it boils down to for me with grants, I treat them like coupons. Uh, like when you're going to the grocery store, you know, well, now maybe not so much because, you know, we're all geared up and all that kind of thing. But if you can think back before a month ago. That other life we used to have. The life we used to have. Um you know, when you go to the grocery store with a coupon, one of a couple things is going to happen. You're either going to buy exactly what you wanted for less money. You're going to buy more of what you wanted because for the same money. Maybe you're going to try something that you never tried before. Those are that's kind of the flavor. When you have a coupon in your hand and you go to the grocery store, those are the things that run through your mind. That's the same kind of philosophy I apply to funding. Um, communities that want to pursue grants, the 100% funding idea is largely not there. Now, there's a few exceptions to that. Um, but by and large, most people, I, again, with the cool people in my life, I'm going to borrow this phrase from another person that I learned. Most people are wanting to give a hand up, not a handout. So uh, most of us are um, so, you know, you need to approach the grant world and the funding world with some cash in hand. Now, that doesn't necessarily for municipalities, that doesn't always necessarily have to mean general fund dollars. There's different ways you can pull out of different places in a municipal budget. And you can also leverage private dollars. Um, I think that's one of the, the trends, you know, when we get to that portion, uh, we'll dive a little deeper. But I think um, municipalities working by themselves and the private sector working by itself, they've got to come together in a whole lot more creative ways these days. I don't think either one of them is going to be able to do it alone uh, by and large. Um, so, you know, having some match dollars and um, knowing what you want and then understanding what the funder wants to do and explaining then to that funder why you're a good partner and why you can achieve your goal and their goal simultaneously. That's that's how you enter the grant game these days. Um, and you very rarely do it by yourself. You're going to do it with partners. Um, they want to see that, again, uh, we'll get more into this in the trends, but um, they want to see that you've carefully thought out your project, how it integrates with other things going on in your community, and how other groups and um, different pieces of your community support that. So that collaboration piece is going to be a, a thread that weaves throughout a lot of a lot of our conversation. Excellent, excellent. One of the first things when when we talked about preparing this interview was um, that you brought up was capital planning, mm -hmm. which you know I think I think a lot of folks on this know that I'm a, a, a planner by degree certification. Um, scars and ticks. Um, capital planning is something that people people do, but they don't want to do often. And to be talking about capital planning as a, a an important tool, especially in a moment where sort of everything is fruit basket upset, um, and where both organizations and communities are really worried about you know what future baseline funding, let alone grants and, and the like, looks like. Why did you start your um, your recommendations to me with capital planning? Well, you're right. It's not fun. <laughs> well, for some people, it's fun. I, I know some people for whom it's fun. They're weird. They're full-blown weird, okay? They are, and they're part of my very cool collection of people. <laughs> Say well, okay, okay. Like they're a, a an animate thing, but um, you know, I I know I people that are gifted, <laughs> right? <laughs> I know people that are gifted with those conversations, and they can help dig into that. the The thing about it is, 
anybody who's going to be able to move forward efficiently with the fewest amount of wrong turns in this thing, um, whether it's a government, a nonprofit, a business, an individual person, a family, those folks that succeed the quickest and the best are going to be the ones that have sat down and thought through it. So as much as it's not fun, you know, I don't know very many uh, organizations that like to do strategic plans. <laughs> um, and capital planning is really just a strategic plan for your big projects and, and some small projects. It's how you're going to spend your money. For municipal plans, uh, for mun municipalities, capital planning means a lot of big ticket items. And, and right now, I, I, I can't see a way to do a capital plan without marrying it to a funding plan. I really can't. Um, it's a scary world um, right now. Uh, Ohio, the way our tax structure is, a lot of municipalities get a lot of their income from income taxes. Well, that's taken a big hit. Um, we get a lot of money from gas taxes, our municipalities do. Well, that's taken a big hit at the same time. And any city manager right now or administrator could tell you the local government funding has mm -hmm. been dramatically reduced in the last couple of years to where, you know, everybody was cheering. Well, at least in the municipalities, they were cheering when the um, governor signed the bill to increase the, the, the gas tax. Uh, consumers didn't didn't be so excited about it, but municipalities thought, oh, okay, we can finally have a revenue stream for our roads and, and, and streets again. And mm -hmm. that just dried up. So, you know, when you're talking about multi-million dollar projects or even a couple hundred thousand dollar projects, those are big chunks. And the smaller the community, the bigger chunk that is out of their out of their budget. Of course, the bigger the community, the more roads and stuff they have to do. So I think to a large degree, some of that's proportionate. But I don't see how anybody does a capital plan without then pairing up on an almost line item basis. How are we going to get some assistance to do this? And what happens because everybody's going to be looking that way, right? Everybody should be looking that way. It's going to be more competitive. It was competitive before. I ain't seen nothing yet. Um, how are we going to regroup then? If we don't get, say, if we get a loan instead of a grant, what do we do then? If we don't get the grant and the project can't move forward, do we resubmit that next year or do we do something else in its place? So you, you have to build in that flexibility and, mm -hmm. and really some of these grant cycles are two, 10, crazy number of years out depending on which funding source you're, you're working with. So mm -hmm. um, again, you know, later on, we're gonna talk about uh, some different things we can do, but um, when we get down to how to how to properly use a consultant, what I what I laughingly call proper care and feeding of your consultants, um, you know, getting somebody who understands all of that to come right alongside you and help you plan that out um, might help you be a little less stressed about it, might make it go a little bit more smoothly, that kind of thing. So, so I, th I think there's a couple of things that. Um, um, are, are key parts of doing the kind of uh, capital or strategic planning that you're talking about that people sometimes don't do. And one of those is to set priorities. Yeah. Um, I see too many strategic plans, too many capital plans, too many uh, fill in the blank plans that are just laundry lists, right? Yeah. And they're laundry lists a lot of times because people don't, who, the, the decision makers either didn't feel like they had the standing, the, the political, popular, whatever, backing to say this one's more important than that one, which is a failure, you know, is, is a, a limitation of um, public engagement a lot of times. Yeah. Or they just don't want to piss anybody off. So if everybody's project looks equally important, then, you know, nobody's pissed off, but then that greatly impairs the ability to get things done as well. The other thing I think that becomes contingent on doing that kind of planning that you've described is 
um, kind of building in some contingency so that it's not an X plus Y will equal Z situation, but sort of an option A, option B, option C. Yeah, the multiple, kind of multiple choice test, the dreaded multiple, multiple choice test. Um, yeah, and I think um, we've lost that luxury of not not making people mad. You know, it's gone. We, we, we have to make hard choices at this point. Um, as much as uh, we are trying to keep our medical community from having to make battlefield decisions uh, with people's health, um, unfortunately, our municipalities are going to have to triage capital projects. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the engagement piece that you're talking about, um, everybody is probably going, well, yeah, right. How are we going to do that now? Well, I, I think, um, and that's another thing that, that I would strongly recommend is folks getting a whole lot more savvy and putting a little bit of money and priority on that wireless infrastructure. Because, and, and Della, you've done a ton of this. You've, frankly, you've written a book on online public engagement, you know, how to make that real. Um, I have some, again, my wonderful friends network, um, some wonderful friends doing a, a strategy called Community Heart and Soul, where um, it's that one-to-one -one conversation, rebuilding that fabric of a community that's honestly, in my opinion, over the past 20, maybe 30 years has been breaking down. Um, community Heart and Soul is a way to reweave that. And some of the communities that have been involved with that have seen remarkable successes. Um, you know, spending millions of dollars in a community of about, I think, 20,000 or so, millions of dollars out of their general fund to tear down a trash incinerator that was in the middle of their downtown. And everybody loved it. Why? Oh, wow. Because they, right? Because they took the time to go around and ask everybody what matters. I mean, that's the whole foundation of Community Heart and Soul is what matters most, asking people. Not assuming you know, not taking a focus group, getting to as many bodies in the community and using that institutional wisdom what to, de to develop a list of what matters most. And then when you have that consensus, your, your political leaders are no longer afraid to take $7 million out of general fund to tear down this trash incinerator. It's Biddeford, Maine. Um, go read about their success story because it's, it's amazing. Um, and then what they were able to do after that, because they had their prioritized list. Um, it's uh, it's just amazing what happens when um, folks take the time to talk and listen. And then um, you were talking about uh, things that people don't do in planning processes, actually implement the plans that they've sat down and, and gone and, and taken the time to make. Um, you know, I can't tell you the number of times, actually, even today, I was talking with my boss about a community that had a plan that was 15 years old. And they thought, okay, we're going to update this plan. We're going to do a new one. And she pulled it out and she says, well, what have you done from the old one? It's all still valid. You know, it's a whole lot cheaper, you know, to just dust off the old one and say, is this still valid? Check, check, check. And just cross through the things that aren't valid anymore and go after the things that are, you know, maybe the strategies will. Absolutely. The strategies have changed in the last 15 days, let alone the last 15 years. But um, just just go check in with folks and, and then do what you know to be right. It, 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 it sounds simple, but I know it's hard, but do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've heard me say this before. Somehow I, I got this phrase in my head a long time ago and I don't know where I got it from. But it's if it were easy, you would have done it already. Yeah. Yeah. If it were easy, you would have done it already. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, sometimes that's a little little piece of encouragement that, yeah, the thing's hard, but, yeah. you know, it is what it is. Yeah. So as before we continue, I just want to make sure that um, if folks have questions um, that they yeah. want to ask Danielle, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, as I said, the chat will also be distributed. So if other people have good answers to a question that's posed in the chat, please feel free. I don't mind a, a, a productive sidebar conversation at all in this case. Yep. But <laughs> And there's the yeah. teacher look. <laughs> yeah. Good yeah, thing I, I love my glasses on today, right? Yeah. Um, 
So, so please feel free to continue to use that chat. We'll address, you know, everything that we can. Um, but as we'll talk about, you know, in a couple of minutes, um, consultant does not equal grand poobah wizard of everything. Oh God, no. So sometimes, you know, great ideas come from the people who are on a call like this with you. So, so just a, a, a moment there to kind of make sure people feel comfortable both putting questions in and also responding if they've got something good to offer. Absolutely. Um, and again, I'll, I'll make that, we'll make that available to everybody. Um, one of the other things that you and I talked about previously as sort of this new normal um, in a, in a, and I've been saying a lot of times lately that I think what we're, we're looking at in part, when we look at the, um, the macro picture, obviously the, the impacts on individuals of the pandemic, um, the health impacts, the, um, you know, the impacts on small businesses, those are kind of unique to the moment. But the underlying trends, I mm -hmm. think a lot of times are, are accelerations of things that we've seen developing over time. So we've known that small businesses need to increase their digital presence. We've known that good planning, like the capital planning that we've just been discussing, that that's really, really crucial to be able to make decisions, especially in a world that is unpredictable. Yeah. So it was unpredictable before, it's just like you said, it's just even more so yeah. right now. And yet in the face of that, you, you you recommended when we were talking before that it was important for communities in order to be able to leverage the funding resources that are available in in whatever context in whatever kind of project it was important to have shovel ready opportunities mm -hmm. and before we get into that i want to make sure that we understand that that's shovel as a metaphor not necessarily shovel ready as we've used it um, a lot of times in economic development where it means there's like this humongous greenfield site that sits vacant for 10 years, even though it has, you know, plumbing and rail lines and whatever. That's not the kind of shovel ready we're talking about here. But in this context, what did you, what do you mean by mm -hmm. metaphorically shovel ready? Um, those projects that are designed and, and have plans ready to go. They've been surveyed. They've been thought through and, and they're ready. And that is a risk, that's a gamble. I'll, I'll be the first to admit that. Um, very few communities have the money to throw around to go on and plan things out that they don't have money to implement. But what we're seeing, well, what we saw with the last stimulus uh, package was that those were the projects, the ones that had those ready, those were the projects that, that moved forward. And I think that's why a lot of um, state DOTs got a lot of the money because they're the ones with the engineers on staff that you know design all day long and they, and they have these things. But um, to the greatest extent possible, um, if, if a community has a project that it knows it has to do, just have to do be it. something in your capital plan yeah. that was identified as a high priority that has community-based consensus, blah, right. blah, blah, just to tie back to the last piece. Right. If if you can, but for a few dollars or a lot of dollars, <laughs> but for the money, this project has to go forward. Those are the ones that need to percolate to the top of the list. And then, you know, as much as you can, get those ready for someone to come along and say, I've got a million dollars. I need to spend it today. Are you ready to send it? Because that's what the stimulus is doing, essentially. When we get down to the infrastructure level, that's essentially what they're saying. Who's ready to use my money today? Not nine months from now when you're finished surveying and designing. Today. Those are the folks that will get the money. Not everybody's going to be able to do that. I understand that. But everybody can sit there and think through and prioritize their capital projects. Everybody should be doing that. It's not fun. It's not sexy. But it's what we need to do if we're going to move on and, and, and move on successfully with the least amount of painful detours and, and missteps. Painful detours and missteps. 
being things that we really don't want. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm full of them, but you know, hey, it's just what are, what are we going to do? School of um, hard knocks, right? <laughs> That's how we learn. <laughs> uh, when it comes to um, you, you said a minute ago, you know, when somebody comes forward with with that piece of money that is your your butt for to getting that project done. Um, one, and, and I think you raised this early on that may or may not come from the conventional government, state, local, federal, whatever, whatever, mm -hmm. um, grant sources. Right. And in some cases, it seems like that's particularly less so. So for example, um, we might, we might talk about this a little bit more. Um, but I don't want to focus on this. So community development finance institutions, yeah. CDFIs, yep. were not included in the CARES Act, the last uh, stimulus act, not the one that's in final phase right now. I don't think we, at least I don't know the details on that one yet. Yeah. But in the last one, CDFIs, who are the funding institution that works with the projects that can't get funded through banks. The through... small businesses that are hurting right now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So the CDFIs didn't get any additional funding out of that. But Google, of all people, did step forward and put a multi-million dollar fund that I'll, I'll put the link in, in the, the results from this. But it's called the Grow with Google Small Business Fund. And that's being funneled through CDFI. Now, CDFIs run the gamut. Not all CDFIs are participating in that. But um, a CDFI is an example of an entity that can pull together funding resources that are perhaps federal, perhaps state, perhaps private, per and, and can come from a variety of sources and make lending and sometimes grant decisions that are um, you know, have different objectives from what the conventional sources do. So why don't you talk a little bit about other kinds of alternative funding strategies that that you've seen unfold in mm -hmm. in communities that you've worked with or communities that that as you put it you've had the opportunity to sort of be touched by yeah um yeah and cdfis uh, if they're not on the front lines i don't know who is um, I can't think of a more important agency at this point, and they're not getting any attention. Um, so now we're going to see the world according to Danielle. Okay. Um, before, you, before we see the world according to Danielle, let me let me just truth in advertising sure. is I'm vice chair of the smallest CDFI in the state of Ohio, um, which is focused on low to moderate income. Um, small business owners, and I am working on having our executive director come on one of these interviews in the next couple of weeks. So if you're interested in CDFIs and, and that potential for impact, um, hopefully that'll be a, a good place to have that conversation. But go ahead. The world, according to Danielle, which is what we all want to hear about. Oh, Lord. Um <laughs> Brace yourselves, brace yourselves. Um, so CDFIs, uh, you know, they, and, and I am not, I am not being paid to say this. I'm not a non-attorney spokesperson, whatever disclaimer you want to put in there. Um, those kinds of organizations, they are the ones that have been long overlooked and they are the ones that have the most to say and the most to give to get us out of exactly this kind of crisis. Everybody knows that the small businesses are the ones that are, you know, they're funding the baseball teams and they're giving money to the band and they're doing all these things, right? But when you turn to programs, when you try to find assistance programs, you get nothing because everybody basically, and, the, and I'm gonna make some people mad here, economic development for a long time has been focused on smokestacks, industry, manufacturing, big jobs, big dollars. Well, that's not where the, 
What's nobody that? who has listened to me has ever heard anybody say anything like that before. Fair enough. Ever. Ever. Go ahead, though. <laughs> well, now you're beginning to see why Dell and I get along so much. Um, so, you know, everybody's been focused on that for so long. They've treated downtown development like the redheaded stepchild. No, and, know. you know, I, I just I've never understood that for 20 years. I've been saying, but the downtown is always one of the community's largest employers. Stop treating it as a bunch of little baby things. It's not. It is a force to be reckoned with if you treat it as an entity. We have got to start doing that. And CDFIs are a way, big way, of, of beginning to support and, and give firmer foundations to the very businesses that, that make up our downtowns. Um, and, you know, not just downtowns, our small independent businesses, um, period, wherever they are. Um, bids and SIDS um, or BADS and SADS, business improvement or special improvement, business assessment, special assessment district, wherever you are in the country, whatever your enabling legislation is, you know, that calls them, they're all essentially the same animal. I'll, I'll call them SIDS because that's what they are in Ohio, special improvement districts. They get a bad rap because people say they're a tax, they're not a tax. They get collected, the assessments get collect, collected with taxes, but it's basically a group of property owners and or merchants that agree on common things that they need to do, buy, whatever, and creating a fund for it. And, and they're collected with taxes as the mechanism to collect those assessments, but they're not a tax. They get a bad rap because they're seen as a tax, but it's, it's people within a group saying, this is our plan of services. Now in Ohio, you can do anything with a SID that isn't specifically mandated by the charter of your community, right? So, you know, a community has to provide lights, okay, light poles but they don't have to provide pretty decorative ones, right? If you want pretty decorative ones, then you know the community come up with a certain amount of money to get the lights and maybe the private sector, if that's a big enough priority for them, they say, okay, we're gonna fund the difference, right? Trash collection, if that's mandated in your community, fine. If it's mandated once a week, great. If you need it in your downtown twice a week, fine. Then the SID can fund that second pickup. You know, they, they a lot of times in Ohio will get funded or started rather uh, through clean and green initiatives, you know, keep the sidewalks clean and shoveled and all that, uh, keep the, the flowers watered, whatever. But they're much more powerful than that. You can do marketing things with them. You can do um, cross-selling, uh, marketing the downtown as a destination, marketing certain niche markets within that, that downtown. Um, you know, taste of X community or whatever can be marketed through a SID. You can uh, constantly update a market analysis. You can do festivals. You can fund overhead positions for an organization to manage your downtown, whether that be a, a main street or whether that be just a, a, a simple downtown management organization of any kind. You know, th those kinds of organizations, very powerful. And they're the thing that I like best about them is they're locally determined. You don't have to ask anybody except for your neighbors <laughs> to re-up this thing. It's, it's dependent yeah. upon the local climate, not what's happening at the city, at the state, or at the federal level for funding. So it's, it's bootstrap funding, basically. Um, and you've got flexibility in design. What's that? You know, you've got flexibility in design. Yes. Of a SID or a bid. Yes. So if you want to um, preference one kind of business, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you've, if you've got a, a particular strategic objective, you can design it to reflect that strategic objective. Um, and I agree with you that, that so often the focus, and, it, and it's interesting, um, a lot of folks on this call know Carolyn De Delutri, who used to be with Main Street uh, National and is now with the International Downtown Association. And one of the things that they have been really focused on lately, um, and they're mostly dealing with the bigger uh, bids, mostly, most states call them bids. Um, Ohio, you know, we had to be special. Um, but even, even the bigger SIDS in Ohio, like Cleveland and Cincinnati and Toledo, um, 
are part are part of this universe that's asking the question of how do we use the mechanisms that we have available to um, to help the homeless population? How do we use these resources to grow specific um, segments of the market that are underrepresented mm -hmm. in our community? So yes, it's a very, very flexible um, resource. And the other thing, I, I don't know whether you want to say anything about other kinds of public private partnerships at mm -hmm. this point, yep. but um, absolutely. One, one thing that folks I see often um, in the independent business alliance world, in the main street world, et cetera, a lot of times folks seem to sort of assume a larger corporation, um, be that a Corning glass or a Procter and Gamble or a, um, you know, pick your, pick your corporation, mm -hmm. um, that isn't the stereotypical storefront type business that they're not going to be interested in participating in these kinds of initiatives. And what, what people overlook when they, when they make those kind of assumptions is that those larger businesses are extraordinarily dependent on the quality of the core of the, the community, the downtown, the independent businesses, the things that give the community that its character to recruit and maintain and keep yeah. talent. And in work that I've done across, you know, corporate environments, that question of how do we keep and maintain the best talent mm -hmm. is, 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 is the central question. Yep. Um, and we overlook the role of these small businesses and these collections of small businesses in, in creating that environment. Yep. Go ahead. Yep. Again, the redheaded stepchild, you know, um, it's. Use that <laughs> term and look at us, lady. I, well, you know, look at my roots though. I'm going to be red again soon. I promise. I promise. I'm already on my hairdresser schedule for whenever this thing breaks. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> Your roots are lovely, dear. They're just uh, lovely. You know, so. I figure gray is God's uh, permission slip to be whatever color I want to be. So I'll just go back to when <laughs> I was younger and was actually naturally red. Um, <laughs> I get it. I get it. All of this under here, it's like all sorts of <laughs> non-red colors. Right. So, um, yeah, you know, and, and to touch on just, I want to backtrack just a second. Um, when you were talking about different programs that SIDS could offer, there was one, I don't know if it's still running this way, in Philadelphia a number of years ago, they were doing workforce development for oh. their homeless population. So oh, when well. you're talking about flexibility, yeah, I mean, it's anything that isn't specifically mentioned in the charter is having to be provided by the city, then the sky's the limit. Your imagination is your only limit for that. Um, so, okay. So get me back on track. What were we, what were we talking about? I'm sorry. I lost Red my train. Children, I think, or, or <laughs> hair dyeing or <laughs> don't worry about that ball. Yeah. No, but, but the, the role that other, that the private sector can play in, oh, yeah. Yeah. in community revitalization. So P3s, the public private partnerships that you were starting on, um, you know, using the opportunity zones, you know, that's not a, an organization per se, but I think being aware of where they are in your communities, if, um, if you were fortunate enough to get one or being part of a lobbying effort to say, hey, wait a minute, we have a few adjustments that need to be made, um, mm -hmm. using those kinds of tools, um, CDCs, community development corporations, community improvement corporations, different things like that that can just help focus, organize, and, and enact whatever it is that you guys think are priorities. It, it, again, it sounds simple, but I know it's hard and do it anyway, because that's the way it's gotta be. So focus, organize, and what, and enact. Enact, yeah, do it. Just implement. So um, you mentioned you're a planner by training. I'm a I'm a planner by mindset. I, I don't have the initials behind my name, but that's that's how I, I see the world. Um, and and nothing makes me sadder than communities that have these plans sitting on their shelves just collecting dust. As a consultant, I got to tell you, I hate that. I hate that as much as people say they hate commissioning them. 
you know, but what most often is, is missing is the implementation. So um, if I can say one thing really quick here before we move on, you know, when, when you talk about plans not being implemented, a lot of them are missing implementation chapters. So when you commission something, make sure you carve out some of the budget to do that or that you have your steering committee carry on or you appoint another committee to figure out how to implement it. Don't say, oh, we're done with this plan. That, that, that's when the hard work actually begins. You know, I mean, planning processes can be exhausting. I understand that. Um, and it's only the beginning. Um, it's the same way with uh, some of the more complicated grant programs. Some of those darn applications are painful to write. Mm -hmm. mm, but that's not implementation. You got to think through how you're going to put those things in, pra in practice, what, what strategies, what framework you're going to have. Um, again, none of this is sexy. None of it's fun, but it, it makes the difference between those that succeed and those that don't. Uh, way back in 1997, when I first learned about the Main Street program um, from an organization now called Heritage Ohio, it was downtown Ohio then, I, you know, I I was like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. Why isn't everybody doing this? This is this just makes so much sense. Why? Why? Those they're, that they're, do, their check, their check's going to be on the way. I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I volunteer for them. I'm not a paid spokesperson. Um, yeah. You know, I, again, with the cool people that that are in my universe, um, you know, the people that get organized and think it through and get the partners to the table that need to be there to implement because the city, a city can't do everything itself for for people that are that are out there waiting for the government to save them. Well, belly up to the table because you're part of we <laughs> you're part of the community and and. Every voice, every voice matters. Every voice has wisdom. Um, not everybody's going to win. Um, we have to do this consensus, not absolute democracy, but where absolute democracy being everyone agrees to everything, not going to fly. Can't wait for that. Um, but, you know, identifying the collective good and getting the necessary partners and resources to the table, those are the places that will succeed. Businesses, families, municipalities, states, whatever it is. Well said, well said. And since I, you know, I dissed on my um, economic development partners and colleagues um, a little while ago, I have to, you know, diss on the planners now a little bit. That <laughs> I've, I've known, you know, I've known way too many planners who um, their greatest joy is the drawing the circles on the map. And it's lovely to be able to make you know, those castles in the air. Yeah. But if we're not actually figuring out how to put that into action, how to make it work yeah. and do so in an unpredictable environment with awareness that it's it's not going to stay the way, it, you know, it came out on paper, yeah. there's no more important part of that job. In the time we have left, and, and Chris, yeah. Chris Nauman gave you a... Um, uh, my my Wisconsin buddy gave you a big thumbs up on the uh, dust collection and said that finding he's finding that many communities and organizations have plans that don't get implemented, but they're caught in the cycle of, as he put it, rinse, wash, repeat. Yes. Um, and interestingly, Wisconsin has is one of the states that has a mandated uh, you have to update your comprehensive your comprehensive plan at least. You have to update every certain number of years, maybe Chris will tell me what the number of years is. I don't know if he knows it. Um, it's not his line of work. Um, but again, just because you're going to have to update it doesn't mean you don't have to put in the work to make it worth the effort. Yeah. In the time that we have left, um, and again, I'm still looking to see any if anybody has any other kinds of questions or 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 things that they they want to try to address, whether it's us addressing it or other folks who are on the um, on the chat, please feel free. But in the, in the time we have left, unless something else comes up, I wanted to talk about, um, as you put it, the proper care and feeding of consultants. <laughs> This is I. This is why I, I said in some of the promotional material for this event 
that you're one of my favorite, and I think I said consultancy type people because I could <laughs> yeah. better, better term. Yeah. Um, and I and I want to tell you the reason why. Now, obviously, you and I get along very well. We have mm-hmm. for a long time. But what I so love and appreciate about you, in that I, I think that particularly the tribe of folks who have gotten to know you in Ohio, Kentucky, Michigan, et cetera, um, that they know about you is that you're going to be honest. You're going to be transparent. You're going to be compassionate. I try. And you're going to, you're going to come along aside them and, and help them work through the unpredictability, bringing in what you've been able to learn from other places over time. But that you were one of the first consultancy type people that I knew who didn't come to this, come to being a consultant from the point of view of, oh, I am the expert. I am the mm-hmm. wizard. I am the one who shall guide you in the right way. And yeah. that's a very particular stereotype. And in and in you know in my writing, I've referred sometimes to short guys with long capes, um, you know, as as part of that kind of stereotype. So so I'm kind of leaning into something that, if you've read my stuff, you know that you know this is kind of my point of view. Um, but I think you know again, it's it's that acceleration process. I think what we're seeing now more than ever, and it's been developing and developing and developing, is that just because I have 35 years of experience and I have done 9,700 thingamajigs <laughs> and, and, you know, look at all the letters after my name and, and all of that stuff, that that becomes increasingly not useless, but only useful if it can be applied in a collaborative manner. And I still see way, way, way too many consultants who don't do it in a collaborative manner. So that's my soapbox. And now it's time for you to do your own soapbox thing on that. It's kind of like, I think you get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've teased uh, the executive director at Heritage Ohio for years that at the annual conference, we need to have a session called Proper Care and Feeding of Your Consultant. Because um, I think a lot of times, um, because of the the folks that are the experts, that communities think that they hire us and that we're going to fix everything. Um, but the danger in that is that I will always be an outsider in every community that I work in. I will never have the wisdom of someone who has lived there 35 years, you know, or five years, or has lived there for three minutes because the fact of the matter is I don't live there. You know, I don't see all of the connections that are in that community. And, you know, the good part is I can pull from 20 years of seeing how other places have done it. Um, I've got, a weird set of perspectives. Sometimes um, I, I see things from different angles than than other people do. Um, I, I really think folks ought to hire a consultant. Well, like any other contractor, you're going to hire them for one of just a couple reasons, because you don't have the time to do what you need to do. You may know how to do it, but you don't have the time. Maybe you don't have the expertise. And sometimes like the leaky faucet in my kitchen, all right? I know how to fix it, but I don't have time. Or I don't know how to fix it and I wanna get somebody else. Because the third reason, sometimes you just wanna yell at somebody else when it doesn't go right. Or you need somebody in between you and the firing squad, you know? We talked about, uh, <laughs> it's the truth. Um, I have a custom made as I didn't know you say it so well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, we talked about the the community leaders not wanting to make unpopular decisions. 
Mm -hmm. Well, those require unpopular conversation sometimes, and you need a facilitator. You need somebody that has been through that process once or twice, has got the calluses either on their forehead or their back or wherever they need to have calluses to have those kind of facilitation positions. Um, you gotta, you gotta be able to bring people in to do the things that you need them to do. And because I'm beating this drum to death today, how do you know what you need them to do by sitting down and thinking strategically, okay? Um, there's a general rule in consulting that the more we touch it, the more expensive it is, okay? So if you can sit down and think through what you actually need us to do before we get to the table or before we even you know, get to the contract stage when we're developing that scope of work, have really honest discussions, not just with one or two people, with all the stakeholders that need to be involved. So if we're talking about a downtown plan, we need to talk to the merchants. We need to talk to the property owners. If you have a Main Street or a downtown organization, they need to be at the table. The chamber, the CVB, the, you know, the economic development office, CIC, whatever, all of those, the city engineer, the emergency service responders, the, all of those folks need to be at the table to say, what do we want out of this thing? Have that conversation first. I, I will only speak in, in first person here because I don't wanna you know, make blanket statements for everyone. But I gotta tell you, if I walk into a room with that group of people, I am excited. I am ready to dig in and I'm ready to say, okay, this community, not only do they know who needs to be at the table, but they're gonna be the ones that can do some of the things themselves. They don't need me to collect data. They don't need me to do certain things. Why pay a consultant to do things that you can do yourself? Unless you don't have the time, you don't have expertise, or you wanna yell at somebody else, okay? But you know, know what you want, know what you don't want. I, I actually walked into an interview for a job one time and, um, I was asking questions about their process that was highlighting holes in, in their, um, their scope. And I watched it play out. We didn't get the job, which was okay. Um, but I watched it play out after they had gone through this process that they had originally um, put out their request for proposals for and watched, you know, six, seven years later as they tried to implement. And I, and I saw things going wrong that, I told them we're going to go wrong, even in that interview. So, you know, bring a consultant in to see the things that you can't, you know, see, see the things from a different perspective. But, you know, there's, there was, used to be a, a funny thing um, going around on email. It was two pictures. Um, there was this little itty bitty boat and it was called original contract. And then there was this really big yacht called change order. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Keep that in mind when you are writing your scope. Because, you know, again, the more we have to touch it, the more expensive it's going to be. I don't like doing that. I don't like doing that. I don't like doing it to a community. I don't like going back and saying, hey, wait a minute. You know, you didn't think this through properly. So now it's going to cost you more money and you didn't have money to begin with. God forbid you got a grant to do it. And then you don't have any more money, period, whatever. So anyway, I, 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 I ramble, but if you, if you can use us to our highest and best potential, we like it better too. <laughs> we don't want to be charging you out the nose to do things that could have been solved in the planning phase. So back to that capital planning, you know, whether it's, it's me or anyone from the company I work for, the company I used to work for, anybody, get a professional to help you see the things that, that you're not seeing and help you think through those steps. And hopefully you'll be able to shortcut some of those missteps. Amen and amen, amen. So thank you so much, Danielle. Any, any, uh, any resources, any, you know, we're, we're at the hour, so we wanna uh, let it go and let people get on with their lives. Um, yep. Any any final thoughts? Any uh, any recommended resources? Any 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 final things of of all the things? Um. Yeah, I guess um, a mini thought. Um, it occurs to me as we're looking at this whole COVID situation. What's that? You have many thoughts. Sometimes. 
<laughs> I don't know how to classify these things, but okay, yeah. go ahead. Um, <clears throat> there's a there's a lot that we can learn um, in our responding to this COVID situation that we can learn from natural disasters, because in a lot there's a lot of parallels to that. Um, I've long been an advocate. I know y'all are going to be shocked. I've been an advocate to have a disaster plan in place. Shocker, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I, I do think that moving forward, we need to learn from this and write it down and, and have a framework in place to respond to whatever the next thing is, whether it be a natural disaster, God forbid we are ever in this kind of position again, but we all know that tough times are going to come, whether they're man-made, mother nature made, whatever they are, <clears throat> we know tough times are going to come. And again, the more prepared we are, the more nimble we can be to, to adapt to those things. Yeah. I guess yeah. that's, that's that. I do have a lot more notes. See, <laughs> maybe that'll be round two. Well, we can definitely do a round two, or if you want to, um, we can do, I think, I think folks might be pretty happy to, you know, get a little insight from your notes. So if, if at some point you're, you know, bored, like that's going to happen, um, and, and you want to type those up, I'll be, I'll be glad to post, you got pretty handwriting. I mean, hell, if you want to just send it to me, I'll type it. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I think, I think, you know, let me put it this way. If you want to share that sure. with folks, you let me know and we'll get that out there. Sure. All right? We touched on it a little bit with the CDFIs. I think that, you know, there's more to be said on the topic of exactly how and who has a role to play. Um, you know, again, not a spokesperson, but I think your Main Street organizations and, and similar organizations have a much bigger role to play. And I think that that's, like I said, maybe a future conversation, maybe not with me, maybe with, with someone else, but, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll put a few, few thoughts together. Sure. Sure. Awesome. Awesome. Well, and I hope we'll get a chance to talk again. I mean, you and I will get a chance to talk again, but I think it'd be a lot of fun to do another one of these um, down the road when, you know, we, we can, uh, complain about hair coloring a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And and you'll post my information. If people have questions about this, they can contact you or through you, me or whatever. Why don't you say it now? And then it will be added to, because we've got folks who are dropping off. Okay. Um, if, if um, just, why don't you tell folks verbally how they can get a hold of you, particularly email address. And I'll make sure that that information um, and any other information you want to share is available with the audio and the video um, recordings sure. of this session. Um, so uh, my eight to five job, my day job is with a municipal engineering firm. So I'll give you that address because that's the one I check most frequently. Um, it's my first initial last name. So D Steinhauser, D for Danielle, S-T-E-I-N-H-A-U-S-E-R at CT Consultants, C like cat, T like Tom, consultants.com. Um, my work phone number is area code 419-469-5465. Um, any questions? Um, I'm, I'm, I do this because I love downtowns. So I, I wanna help as many downtowns succeed as I possibly can. And you mentioned Heart and Soul um, just quickly. Um, what's your role with Heart and Soul and um, where would you suggest people go to learn more about that? Sure. Um, I'd be happy to answer some questions about it. I'm a coach in training, um, which means that um, I'm going through a certification process. I'm about halfway through at this point. I was supposed to be attending another training in about a week, but we all know where that went. Um, so, uh, yeah, if they want to know more, just Google Community Heart and Soul. And um, they'll go right to that website. I believe it's communityheartandsoul.org. Um, just it's another community engagement strategy. And of all the ones I've looked at, it again, the whole point is what matters most. And isn't that what we all should be identifying? I mean, just it makes the most common sense to me. 
So yeah, you can read about communities that have used it, um, get in touch with um, staff or uh, other coaches in your area, because it is a national program. So it's rolling out. I know in Wisconsin, it's uh, being talked about pretty heavily. Um, so there's lots of local different, different folks, lots of different places. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Danielle. Thank you. This was fun. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad. I had a, had a blast too. So have a great weekend and I'll touch in with you next week. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks. Bye now. Bye, Bye dear. This is free on play the time to speak the truth, frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured. We'll revive and we'll prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert.